All right, that was very easy. Thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate it. I, I don't think it's necessarily essential in our lives today. I think it's essential always in the human experience and human mind. That's how we live our lives. That's how we remember our lives. That's how we navigate the world. And uh, I can't imagine making art without some reference or structure of story to it because that's, that's how I think about the world. That's how we live it and that's all we have. When we get to the end of our lives, it, everything that we might have accumulated from wealth to houses to places to even people will eventually all be gone and the only thing we'll have is our own story and that's it. So it's the one thing we carry with us from the time we're born to when we die. So. Well, I'm not sure. I mean, it's, I mean, there's something about the act of reading that is somehow I don't know if it's like hypnotic or it's somehow connected to the way that we navigate the world. I've read in a couple of places that people who experience great trauma in their lives are taught to move their eyes back and forth really rapidly because for some reason it eases the processing of trauma, which is kind of interesting, which sounds crazy, but if maybe it's true, I don't know. And I know that as a cartoonist, I'm constantly having to move back across the page, back and forth. And so is anybody reading text, but especially in comics, your eyes are moving around in space. I don't know, but I, you know, aside from the fact that we are obviously reading stories about real, or hopefully people who feel real, who go through experiences that might be something along the lines of what we experience and maybe can provide a sense of empathy or some sort of solace, I hope. That's at least what I hope for. I try, I don't know. <laughs>It's not a style in so much as that it's just simply a way of trying to make a picture as uninteresting as I possibly can so that you don't really look at it, but you look through it. In the same way that when you're reading a page of text, you look through the words themselves. You don't study the letter forms, you don't study the words. It becomes almost invisible so that you pay attention to the pictures that are created in your mind. In comics, the pictures are still there, but you're sort of seeing them and remembering them at the same time. And as you read them in the same way you read words, they seem to come to life on the page. It's kind of a peculiar blend of reading and theater at the same time, if that makes any sense at all. It's sort of like watching, it's sort of like remembering, it's most like reading. Very kind of strange. And it's, I think it's the only art form that really harnesses that very kind of strange ability that human beings have to read as well as see the world, if that makes sense at all. Sometimes, I mean, sometimes when I start a page, I'll think of a gesture or a movement or a sound or an activity or something that has captured my imagination is kind of playing over and over again in my mind and I might start with that. But fundamentally I'm trying to get at this weird thing that I've kind of started to think of over the years is the music of life. There's a sort of a musical experience of life that we have, which I noticed when I first started to read comics that didn't have words. Because when I read the pictures I still heard sounds in my mind. And it, anybody can have this experience. If you look between two objects that are very similar, you'll hear different sounds in your mind that indicate to you that you're sensing something different between the two. So I try to pay attention to those invisible sounds in my mind when I'm writing a story because I think that's a lot of how we interpret the world and how we can tell whether other human beings are telling us the truth or not. As you can sense when somebody is lying to you by the way that they gesture or use their hands or look at you or don't look at you. That's a, it's, a, it's a very primal sort of human experience. And I think it goes back to before language. I think if we could time travel back 10 or 20,000 years, I think we'd find cavemen singing at each other, not talking. So I think that's one of the reasons why music is so powerful. But all cartoonists are crazy. I should have warned you about that. So.
pretty much everything. I mean, there's even stuff I don't like still affects me because then I know what I don't want to do in comics. Mostly what I don't want to do is illustrate a story. I want to tell the story in pictures. I want the pictures to be the story itself, not to provide illustrations to words. That's very important. But I think some of the very greatest cartoonists are Charles Schultz, who did Peanuts, Robert Crumb, Art Spiegelman, Richard McGuire, Joe Sacco, Gary Panter, Linda Berry. But I think the best cartoonist who ever lived thus far, and maybe will never be bettered, is George Harriman. And you had a show of George Harriman here three or four years ago, I think, uh, which I'm sorry I missed. And it's the only retrospective of Harriman's work. And he, he saw what was happening both with America and human beings and how they were developing and very gently put it into his strip, which is about racial inequality. But he also, uh, in this strip, which was set in the American Southwest, um, talked about the plight of indigenous people in uh, the Americas. And again, racial inequality and especially uh, gender uncertainty. That was the thing that made people most uncomfortable about Crazy Cat, was that it was unclear whether the main character was male or female. It's amazing that he could see these things a hundred years ago with this beautiful, beautifully drawn, beautifully written strip. That's hard to, that's always kind of a hard to sort of like cutting open the squash and opening it up and seeing all the strings and everything inside, you know, and to try to figure out how the plant grew. I mean, obviously everything I've ever written is somehow connected to my experiences in life, whether they're things that have actually happened to me or things that I'd like to think would happen to me or things that I've read about happening to other people that have somehow stuck in my mind for one reason or another. So. I did notice early on when I first tried to write biography that I was limited by trying to make sure that it was accurate. So I would get stuck in the details, like writing about my grandmother thinking, well, wait, what was that shirt that she wore that it looked like? Or what did that salt and pepper shaker actually look like? And then I realized this is crazy. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. And when then I introduced her as a character in, in fiction, she suddenly came alive on the page in a way she hadn't before. So. It's sort of the same thing that we all do when we dream every night, where people who have died come back to life in our minds, because we still have a memory of them. We have a sort of embodiment of them in our minds that's not based on particulars, but is based on their essence. So I think at least that's kind of what I'm trying to get at, I guess. It's probably easier to talk just about comics fiction because I try to structure the pages in such a way that the images themselves create a secondary composition on the page um, that is somehow larger than the sum of its parts in the way that I, I would think that if we could somehow get beyond our own experiences and look down on them and see them all at once, it would seem like a very strange sort of shape. I think we live in a shape we don't quite understand. We're always kind of moving through life or life is passing over us like a stream. The shapes of our lives are very complicated and circuitous and odd and I think we follow things that we don't quite understand. I don't actually believe we have free will. I think we think we have free will but I don't think we do and that's okay because it doesn't matter because if we believe we do then I think who cares. I think we're following paths that we don't quite understand, but are very predetermined and, and strangely arranged. And I try to get a sense of that on the page itself. So I also sometimes think that free will and predeterminism actually can coexist because I think they do in the quantum world. I think that's kind of what they've discovered. So who knows? I beats me. So I'm just a cartoonist. So I'm not a quantum physicist, but. <laughs> Or I curated one show in Chicago about the history of comics in Chicago and how the city of Chicago itself seemed to provide comics and cartoonists the impetus to start writing about real life and to use comics as a medium of expressing what real life was like as opposed to fantasy or jokes or things like that. And I designed the entire show. That was just because I was interested in it and the uh, Chicago Cultural Center invited me to do it. So I said, sure. So I taught myself how to do 3D modeling and I designed the entire thing as well and it was the pandemic so 
I don't, I mean, comic art on the wall is, can get boring very, very fast. It's sort of like you've seen one, you've seen them all. So I tried to limit the amount of original artwork itself and to focus more on the art of reproduction because comics are an art of reproduction. They're an art of printing, they're an art of making stuff and having things and having things to throw away and detritus and ephemera, which is much more interesting in a lot of cases than the, the original art. And it makes the original art more like a gem, so I tried to focus on it that way. But I don't know how comics can work in a museum. I've been trying to figure that out now for a couple of decades, so that was one attempt at it, but so. I think there's sort of a resistance, an understandable resistance, not an intentional resistance, but an understandable resistance in the art world, since that's, I was trained as a painter and sculptor and printmaker, to not quite understand what to do with images that are meant to be read versus ones that are meant to be looked at. Because you hang them on the wall, you're gonna look at it. It's very uncomfortable to read something on the wall. It's much easier to read it in a book. The experience is different. At the same time, the legitimacy that a museum offers is really important to the overall understanding that there's a lot of serious, thoughtful cartoonists out there and they tend to be very nice, unpretentious people from my experience. And they make good art and it's interesting and it's worthy of, of consideration. It's not just junk. There's a lot of junk for sure. There's no question about that. 90% of it is junk, but there's a 10% of it that's quite interesting. And there's, there's tons of great artists doing interesting work. And um, I think any museum that is willing to try to figure out a way to present that to an audience that probably already likes the work in and of itself and is curious about the life of the cartoonist or how it's made will find that it might be a positive thing. So any, any museum that's willing to do that, and I'm so grateful to the, to the Reina Sofia for doing that with the George Harriman show, I think is you know, wonderful. So especially in America, because we're just treated like idiots there so for the most part <laughs> but